Thank you so much. I, I, am, I am so privileged and so blessed to be here. Uh, I, I'm just proud of, of all of you and the work that, that, that is uh, happening through Live With Purpose Church. I, I, uh, I look back and I, 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 I've been here since the beginning, just when it was just a suggestion uh, uh, of, of, hey, it would be nice to, to build a church here, to start a church here four years ago to, to the, the fruition of it and, and, and just seeing what you're doing and uh, your, your team going to Honduras and, and, and making impact there and, and just so much more that, that God has. But, but I want you to know something that I personally believe that cross, uh, live with purpose. I believe that, that our fellowship in the Life Ministries fellowship, would enta- which involves live with purpose and, and all the other uh, satellites and church plants that we have, I believe that we are at a crossroad. I believe that, that it's, we're, we're entering a, a season and a time where God is going to do uh, some accelerated uh, uh, development, increase, uh, whether it's personal growth or, or corporate uh, uh, growth. I, I believe we, we are at, at, a, a, uh, at a crossroad for, for uh, what God is wanting to do as it relates to taking us uh, where he wants to take us as we are moving forward with not just the birth of churches or the birthing of churches and the building of leaders and future ministers, but I believe even as a fellowship. Because the idea of a fellowship is to create a synergy that collectively allows us to impact nations in a more uh, uh, effective and efficient manner. And so we know that the greatest resource in the fellowship is people. And and the building up of individuals, uh, the building up of corporate communities like, like Live With Purpose, all is part of the, the great vision of synergistically flowing together to make impact inroads and transformation all around the world. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why uh, you see nations represented in, in, all, in, in all our works, uh, satellites as well as uh, churches. That's why uh, just in a year of existence, you took your first trip to Honduras. It's part of the impl- implanting uh, uh, into our hearts as a community of faith that we don't just exist for each other. Amen. When, when, a, when a corporate body uh, just exists for each other, to comfort each other, to, to encourage each other, uh, uh, what begins to happen eventually, it begins to shrink because, because God didn't create us uh, just for us four and no more. He created us to be a light, to be salt. And, and so we encourage each other to do the work Amen. beyond the walls and beyond us that God has called us to do. Amen. Now, taking and understanding all of those realities, we must then realize that there are foundational principles and truth that help us to be motivated and to go beyond the obstacles that rise up against us. And there is no one here who in some way is not facing an obstacle. Whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, uh, or whether it's psychological. There are, there are things in our lives in themselves that continuously uh, can cause us to place limits upon ourselves and or each other uh, if, if we're not careful. And, and, and so 
understanding this, what we have to realize is that there are some foundational truth, foundational truth that the enemy will come against in your life and in my life to try to get us to shrink back versus forcefully advance. And I know for a fact that many of you here today, not because any of the pastors have spoken to me, just because I know that I'm hearing from God. I know that many of you are right now being challenged with things that, that maybe a month or two months ago were no-brainers. This is a foundational truth. No problem. And, and what has happened and what is happening, not just in Live With Purpose, but, but all, in Christendom as a whole, it, it has to do with, with human behavior and the spiritual warfare that we are facing what happens is that before you, you step into that, into that more of God, there, there, there's an assault that comes, and that assault is designed by the enemy to assault the very truth that has gotten you to where you're at. And it's, the, the, what, what's interesting is that you figure that truth is a strength, and it is a strength, but that's why the enemy comes against it, because... Because he, 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 already, he already has influence in the areas, probably not necessarily. He, he, it's not a big deal. You know, if you're struggling with this or that, that's, that's something you're giving to God. And you, but these things that are solid, that are foundational, that are core, if he can shake that, if he can shake that, then he can cause you to pause. And if he can cause you to pause, then he can, he can cause you to fear. And if he can cause you to fear, he can cause you to doubt. And if he can cause you to doubt, he can cause you to settle for less. And so, so I want to share a, a portion of scripture with you. There are some dynamics of this that I have already spoken to you about, but I, I want you to just listen to me. And let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you as it relates to the truth in your life that is being challenged. And that is very diverse. Can you say amen? amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the reading of His Word impact you and produce from you and through you the will of our living God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. John chapter 12, verse 9 through 11. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him, also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Today I begin with a declaration of truth. And that declaration, as you have heard me say before, we all here today are the embodiment of God's miracle working power. This, 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 this dynamic of this word embodiment literally means a perfect representation of God's redemptive grace and power. You and I are a perfect representation of God's redemptive grace and power. Every day that you and I live for God in righteousness, your life literally is a testimony of his reality. All you have to do is breathe today and live. And your walk with him naturally testifies of his power and of his grace. Can you say amen? amen. Now this is why the enemy fights so hard to rob us of our confidence in God. If he can rob your confidence, then he can affect your faith. And we know that when our faith is effective... We are more apt to waver. And that is why the word of God says that without faith it is, it is impossible to please God. Mm -hmm. Because faith is what moves us beyond ourselves. Yes, that's right. yes. Amen. And when, when, when you're not operating in faith, you most likely are operating in fear. That's right. And they, they produce different fruit. Fear produces a uh, different fruit than faith does. So, 
as his embodiment on the earth, you and I give hope to hopeless people. We reflect his love and compassion to a people alone and lost. Pastor Joe talked about that when he says, pray that you can invite someone. There are people that are alone, that are hurting. Your presence and your friendship, amen, uh, as the embodiment of grace and God's miracle working power helps to restore people's dreams and, and, and to reignite faith in their lives. This is why this war against us is so real and so strategic and so, uh, how would I say, uh, so powerful. Because the enemy knows the power that is within you and the testimony that you are. This, it, it, it's, like, it's like our text. They were not satisfied just to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill the miracle. Amen? Because the reality is this, that the miracle of Lazarus was designed to far outlive Jesus. Therefore, the miracle of Lazarus was going to have greater impact on that community than the actual reality of Jesus. Yeah, they would come to believe in Jesus, which made them right with God, but the miracle was what was going to give them the courage to face the opposition and to face the, the, the reality of all hell that was going to come against them because of this newfound faith. Mm -hmm. To look back and say, hey, hey, hold up. What do you mean he's a false prophet? What do you mean that he was just another messianic claimant? What are you talking about? I know. I saw my friend was in the tomb four days. The dude was stinking. And he came out of that alive and well. And he's still living over there, to, uh, living and breathing. Yes, Jesus isn't with us. But I see his power. Every day I see the power of God when I look at my friend Lazarus. Yes. So that's the reality of who we are. And of this awesome, awesome miracle. So this war is real and he wants to quiet our testimony. And in our text, they didn't just want to kill Jesus, they wanted to quiet the testimony of Lazarus. And so you and I, beloved, part of this battle against the very truth that has brought us to this very present moment is because he wants to quiet us. He wants to quiet you. He wants to get you to a place where you question the reality of your faith and the power of God working in your life. Because if he can get you to doubt, he can get you to fear. And if he can get you to fear, he'll get you to pause and to shrink back instead of forcefully advance. Can you say amen? amen. So we see that Lazarus was the embodiment of divine purpose. And like I said before, long after uh, they killed Jesus, his miracles testified of his reality. Not just Lazarus, but the other miracles that took place. We as carriers of his cross also live to represent him. So, so hell has put a bounty on us. Hell has put a bounty. There is a bounty on your head. There is a literal contract on you. Amen. And, and let me tell you something, the devil can't kill us, uh, uh, but, but he can sure try to hinder us. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? He can sure try to hinder us. And, and so this is, this is, this is real. Uh, and and so, so hell is doing its part to quiet our testimony. These are realities of truth that we have witnessed. I have two examples that I want to share with you uh, uh, of of this of this dynamic that I'm talking about. Uh, the first one is 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 John the Baptist, and 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 uh, uh, just just what the Bible teaches us about how how his truth was challenged at, at a very crucial time 
in his life. So, so let me just read to you John, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 11, where it says, When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went uh, out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who, those who do not turn away because of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowd. What kind of man do you go? What kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind, or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, of all who ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist, yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Now I want us to note something today, that John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. There is no doubt John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. However, somehow, he couldn't reconcile the pain and the suffering that he was experiencing. He could not, it, it, it just didn't make sense to him that here he is, he's done nothing but been faithful to God. He's done nothing but, but, but been a messenger of divine purpose. And yet his reward is he's in a dungeon locked up in the darkness with rats crawling around his feet uh, uh, his life uh, uh, in peril and, and this, this pain and this suffering this opposition causes him to doubt the very truth God had, had, met, had made very clear in his life and this is, this is important beloved this is important because in John the Baptist, we see, we see how the enemy visits us at those moments of pain, at those moments of suffering, at those moments of difficulty, at those moments of trauma, at those moments of crisis, at those moments of shock when we're confronted with realities that we did not expect, did not want. And how the very truth that has been what has gotten us up to this point is the very thing that we begin to waver on and question if we're not careful. So unable to recognize, we tend to question ourselves, our efforts. Yes, in some cases, even our faith. To better understand this and to affirm it, let's look what the scripture says about what John said, knew. So that it's not just Pastor Phil telling you that John knew. Let's see. It's recorded. It says in John chapter 1 verse 29 through 37. John the, uh, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am. For he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, he told, God told me, yes. God told me, yes. wow. listen, he said, God told me the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest, is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, I saw this happen to Jesus. Yes. So God talked to me. Well, God sent me. God talked to me. God showed me. Amen. Amen? So I testify, he said, that he is the chosen one of God. 
Then it goes on and it reads, The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples as Jesus walked by. John looked at him and declared, Look, now he's publicly testifying. In other words, now it's just be, not between me and God. Now I'm even publicly testifying. He says, Look, there is the Lamb of God whom John's two disciples heard. Uh, excuse me. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. So literally... John the Baptist literally allows his disciples, his pupils, his spiritual sons to transition from his covering to the covering of Jesus. To the covering of Jesus. So now it's not just God told, not not just God sent me, God told me, God showed me. Now it's I testify and I affirm. I affirm by saying to those who follow me, follow him. <laughs> so, so I don't think there's a doubt that John knew Jesus was the Messiah. Can, can, can we confirm that? And yet this very truth which is foundational to his whole existence as a prophet is now being shaken. At the point of of danger, trouble, negativity, people talking about him, people criticizing him, threatening him, you're going to hang, you're going to hang. So we we, we clearly see the mighty man of God who had great revelation and faith clearly knew who Jesus was, yet there are moments of pain and suffering. And this is when the enemy visits us. And he visits us with a very specific purpose, and that is to challenge our truth. To challenge our truth. So that we can question ourselves, even of that which we know to be true. Yet the irony of all of this is that even though John wavers, Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He actually rewards and assures his friends' ministry and worth in the kingdom. (laughs) And we know that Jesus had no problem rebuking unbelief. And we know that he had no problem. But he doesn't rebuke the unbelief of John the Baptist. On the contrary, he affirms and validates him. Because being human, Jesus understood. Not not just understood how this battle plays itself out. But how human tendency reacts to the challenges that life brings and that the enemy takes opportunity of to whisper into our hearts and into our minds to challenge the very truth that is so central and significant in our lives. I would say this, what truth in your life is being challenged? It could be anything. It could be your worth, your value, your gifting, your calling, your anointing, your capacity. For me, it's often my capacity. Why? Because all of my life and my development, I was made to feel inadequate and insignificant. So anytime that there's a new challenge in my life, those voices speak to me. And I have to minister to myself. Remind myself the truth that I know. That's right. It's it my my capacity to move beyond that challenge has has everything to do not with the absence of opposition, but with the boldness that rises up when I minister to my soul. The truth which I have, that has been revealed in and through my life. That's right. 
And so I have to minister to me. I have to remind me. Just like Jesus is ministering about John the Baptist. I have to minister to myself. No, you man of God. You've been called. You've been chosen. You've been appointed. And believe me, there are people who have literally to my face questioned my calling. Questioned my anointing. Questioned my, my motivations. Would have been very easy to shrink back. Very easy to become a people pleaser. Very easy. It's not the absence of doubt that has allowed me to move forward these 30 something years. It's the confidence that eventually I get to as I minister to myself and I refuse to believe anything but the opposite to what I know to be true. I always go back to that 33rd floor encounter. I always go back to those moments in my life where God showed himself so strong and so real and so true. I always go back to those moments. Either I am insane... There's no, there's no gray area. Either I am truly deluded or God is true and real and I need to get on board with what he has said and done and stop concerning myself with external circumstances. Yes. I love what Jesus says. He sends John the Baptist a message. Listen to the message. Tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. He's not denying what John's going through. Don't turn away, John. Don't turn away. Don't give up your truth. Jairus, I know what your servant said, but trust, only believe Jairus, believe Jairus, believe. They had just come and told them, don't bother the master, your daughter died. Jesus stops and says, only believe Jairus. In other words, I have another plan. I have another plan. And that is the plan that the enemy wants to disqualify you from and for. God has another plan. It may not be manifested in its entirety right now. It may not be uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a here and now present state. But God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And let me tell you something. If you live to tomorrow... That plan is going to take you further and further and further into God's plan and purpose for your life. What, what he wants you to understand is simply this. Simply this. Endure. Hold on. Trust him. Continue to believe. Forget about what the outside circumstances are saying. We're not motivated by what we see. We are motivated by an unseen reality. That is faith. The capacity to believe in the promises of God for our here and now. Even when all external realities are speaking to the contrary. I close with this. This is exactly what Satan did to Adam and Jesus. He questioned them about the very truth they knew. It's a strategy of the enemy. He did it with Adam and Eve. The very truth they knew. Because in that questioning, what he's trying to do, listen to this, is shift your perception of God. 
or the truth. Because if you question the truth you know, you question the author or promiser of that truth. That means you allow somehow, some way for your perception of God to be shifted. That's what Adam and, and, and Eve did. In a moment of time, he shifted in their minds a God who was a giver to a God who was a withholder. Oh no, he just really doesn't want you to have from this fruit because if you have from this fruit, you'll be like him, you'll know. So now all of a sudden, God's not a giver, he's a withholder. And when you see God as a withholder, you then begin to, you're at the precipice of becoming entitled. Because you deserve better. Yes. But when you see God as a giver, you're satisfied. Yes. And you're confident. And so in the mind of Adam and Eve, this God who gave them everything except this one thing, all of a sudden their, their perspective of him is shifted from a liberal, loving, caring God to a God who is holding back from them. Something they, they have the right to have. <laughs> He does it with Jesus. The difference between the first Adam and the second Adam is that the first Adam fell at the first lie. The second Adam, he takes three shots at him. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit into the desert to fast. Now think about it. He's denying himself of basic human needs. Shelter, and food. He is out there on his own. The flesh is feeling neglected and abandoned. And it's at that state of weakness that Satan visits him to, to assault the truth he knew. And what was the truth he knew? That God was a provider. Satan goes, hey, turn these rocks into stone. You can do that. In other words, provide for yourself. He's not. In other words, your father, who you say is a provider, is withholding from you. You have a right to eat. But Jesus understood. And he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And that truth is, is, is solidified. And so Satan has to move to another area of vulnerability. And so he goes the religious route. He takes him to the top of the temple. The highest place in the temple. Which is a picture of, of for the Jews, the center of their faith. And he says, this God, this father of yours, he's not going to let you get hurt. Go ahead. Throw yourself off. It says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Listen, God doesn't have to prove anything to us. The simple fact that he has saved us and delivered us is sufficient to take us and bring us into eternity. If he chooses to show himself, let it be because it's his will, not because you force him to. Or are trying to force him to. You can stand your ground and claim your promises. You can do that. You have that right. He has given you that right. To stand upon the truth and claim that truth. But at the end of the day, God's will must supersede even our own. Yes. Don't tempt him. Don't, don't, don't make him prove himself. He's already proven himself. So when you have a need, just say, God, manifest yourself. Yes. Not prove yourself. Just manifest yourself. Show yourself in this. You don't need to prove anything to me. I know you are my deliverer. Amen. I know you are my healer. Amen. I know you are my strength. Yes. I know that. You don't have to prove it to me. I need you to manifest yes. that 
reality of yours in my life now. And then, of course, we know that he takes him and he shows him all the kingdom of the world. And he says, worship me and I'll give them all to you. <laughs> and the Lord speaks in response to him and says, it is written again. Amen. There's only one God and him alone who you serve. In other words, this is going to be mine anyway. It's all going to be mine anyway. You can't give me what's going to be mine anyway. I, I, I just have to go through this. I, I said go through it. This is, this, is, this is a cup I got to drink from. But, but when, I'm done, when I'm done processing this, when I'm done digesting this, when I'm done experiencing this, I'm going to come through this stronger than I entered it because of who is with me navigating through it. And so this is not happening to me. This situation is not happening to me because I'm a mistake, because I'm a failure, because I'm, in, because I'm insignificant, because I'm in, in, inadequate, because I'm insufficient. This, this is not happening to me. I am not here because I'm broken. I am not here because of, 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 of sin. I am not here because I am here simply because here is my reality and God will reveal himself here for me right now. In other words, I'm not going to entertain for a minute that you challenge any of the truth that I know. Thank you. Yes. And this is important because to go to the next level, it's upon that truth that is being challenged that you will launch. into that next place. So I believe that as a fellowship, God is, is doing something to bring us to greater levels of effectiveness and, and to greater levels of, of impact. And so the challenge is going to be individually, we're going to recognize that there are battles that individually we have to face. And whatever they may be, we do it individually, we do it corporately. Meaning I know it's my burden, but part of what a community of faith does is bear one another's burdens. So we're going to do it collectively, we're going to affirm each other, we're going to validate each other, we're going to pray for each other, we're going to minister to each other, but most importantly, we have to learn how to minister to ourselves. And you minister to yourself by standing on the truth you know. That's right. Yes. Because it's that truth that you know that the enemy wants to rob from. That's right. Amen? Yes. I thank God for allowing me to minister to you today. I know we needed to hear this. Yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, you, you're a miracle. You're a work in progress. You're a miracle. Amen. And there is enough that God has done in this past year and a half to launch you into the next year and a half. That enough. So take your eyes on what you see as deficient and put your eyes on what you see, which is glorious. Amen. Because if, you, if you're always looking at what you don't have, you won't do what you need to do to, to gain what has not yet been gained. Look at what you have, celebrate what you have, and recognize that this is what will launch you into, into what you're yet to, to, to possess. There's a lot of good things happening here already, individually, personally, corporately. You, have, you, you, you now are on the radar. Not God's radar. You've always been on the God's radar. You're now on the devil's radar. You are a blip on his radar. Amen? Amen. So, stand on the truth. 
The truth doesn't just set you free. The truth keeps you free. That's right. Amen. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. I'm going to ask Ryan and, and, and Joe and, and Jody and, 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 and Jen, if you guys would come up, you, you four guys. And I said, I said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the truth also keeps you free. And so I'm going to begin this altar call. If you guys would stand in the front and, and I'm going to run out because I have to go preach at Live With Purpose. Excuse me, at, at, 